Good afternoon. My name is Dais Matthews, and I'm a PhD student at Cornell University, and my co-author is Dr. Kelly Reddy Best, Associate Professor at Iowa State University. The title of our research is Collegiate Fashion and Activism, Black Women's Styles on the College Campus, a Mountain and Digital Museum Exhibition. There is a rich history of people utilizing dress as an expression of their blackness and activism combating multiple forms of oppression and discrimination against black people. For example, during the 1960s, black people utilized what Dr. Tanisha Ford refers to as soul style or a fashionable expression of blackness as a way to visibly identify with the civil rights era and to be seen as black enough. According to Dr. Denisha Blake, expressing and negotiating Black identity in many ways is a form of fashion activism or the labor marginalized communities undertake to leverage fashion, style, or dress to affirm their identities, build community, and resist um, oppressive structures in society. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense adopted a paramilitary uniform consisting of object uh, berets, leather jackets, uh, light blue or black turtlenecks, and black slacks and um, skirts. Towards the end of the 20th century, there was an apparent upwelling of Black-owned fashion brands that emulated styles which came to be known as urban wear styles. Some of these brands included Baby Fat, Carl Kanai, Fubu, and Anichi, which all became indicative of Black culture and therefore provided a platform for Black style to take center stage in an industry that had historically deemed it valueless and unprofessional. Some examples of garments and accessories within urban wear include large jewelry, specifically hoop earrings and gold robe chains, uh, brightly colored garments, baggy and oversized pants and shirts, velour sweatsuits and Kangol bucket hats, which you can see here worn by LL Cool J. <clears throat> the Black Lives Matter movement was founded in 2013 after the murder of Black 17-year-old Trayvon Martin, who was unarmed when he was shot and killed by neighborhood watchmen due to racial profiling in Sanford, Florida in 2012. Since Martin's murder, countless other unarmed Black people have continued to be killed um, at the hands of law enforcement and have garnered the support of the Black Lives Matter movement. Some of the, the most um, publicized killings of unarmed Black people include Sandra Bland, Mike Brown, Tamir Rice, uh, Philando Castile, Breonna Taylor, Botham John, and George Floyd. <clears throat> Since its inception, activists and other supporters of the Black Lives Matter movement have used dress to express their solidarity. Some examples of garments include slogan t-shirts and pens that display phrases such as, I can't breathe. The phrase Eric Gardner was saying while gasping for air as he was being strangled to death by police. Black Lives Matter supporters have also worn hoodies to express solidarity, specifically because Martin was wearing a hoodie at the time he was racially profiled and murdered. To build on past work, we examine how Black women use dress and appearance practices as a way to negotiate their Black identity, interest in activism, and or experiences with empowerment. We focused on a particular space and time, campus life at predominantly white institutions during the Black Lives Matter era from 2013 to 2019. The Black women in this research mobilized their bodies, style politics, and communities of style in an effort to decolonize their minds resist oppressive structures and produce knowledge that liberates them, a concept introduced by Dr. Blake. We explored these women's everyday fashion activism through analysis of objects, photographs, and stories in a mounted exhibition at Iowa State University in 2019, which was also turned into a digital exhibition. 15 Black women college students attending predominantly white institutions in Iowa shared stories through an in-depth wardrobe interview. Using the social historical exhibition making process, the interviews focused on the women's use of fashion to express blackness and activism. The wardrobe interview method allows for an in-depth understanding of the multiple identities that are articulated through the material culture of clothing. The women collectively loaned 40 garments or accessories discussed during their interviews, which were used to create the vignettes for the exhibition. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with Iowa's location, it is a Midwestern state with a predominantly white population and it's mostly covered in farmland. It is highlighted in red on this map. 
The Black women shared images during the interviews to solicit memories with the garments, which we featured on the walls of the gallery as seen here. The reasoning behind the large scale 48 by 36 inch images that were posted throughout the gallery was to combat the perpetual and overrepresentation of large scale images of white men within the university environment. We wanted to create a space where Black women are visually represented. Here are more examples of the large scale images that were displayed in the gallery. Through 11 vignettes, we explored the ways Black women represent themselves every day within the current highly turbulent social climate. We focused on 2013 to 2019 as there has been a significant increase in Black activist involvement following the start of the Black Lives Matter movement in 2013. To give, to give a sense of the overall exhibition, this is a one and a half minute video walkthrough of the 500 square foot gallery space. In the theme 90s throwback, we captured the experiences shared by the women that they often negotiate their activism or blackness through dress by, by wearing clothing inspired by 1990s black culture. These styles consisted of bright colors and geometric shapes, which were styles often worn by actors and actresses on black 1990s TV shows such as A Different World or Sister Sister. The vest here owned by Ani captures this style and therefore enables her to negotiate her Black identity while on campus. Bajalis inherited her grandmother's mumu after her grandmother passed away in 2016. She wears this garment to remember her grandmother who taught her how to be a strong Black woman. By declaring her grandmother as the matriarch of the family and then wearing this garment, Vajalis is reclaiming and rejecting stereotypical controlling images of Black women being too strong or too independent. She said, I wear this one because it symbolizes the matriarch of our family and the place she holds. It's just the power in this dress. I always remember her wearing dresses like this. It just kind of symbolizes the strength in something that's really simple. Her statement is reflecting or her statement is reflective of being connected to Black women elders within one's family and wearing their garments as reminders and embodiments of the lessons learned. Some of the women utilize DIY principles to create garments that represent their Blackness and activist identity. They often viewed this as one of their most authentic expressions of identity. Some garments in bright colors such as orange and red were worn to express a pride in skin tone. Princess said, bright colors go well with darker skin tones, so I wear a bright color just to make my skin pop. The Black women expressed that wearing African-inspired garments or accessories made them feel connected to the continent of Africa, which some of the women referred to as feeling connected to their roots. They often wore these designs as a way to visibly and overtly express their Blackness 
or Black identity while increasing their confidence and Black pride. Bianca stated, some of my more deeply rooted clothing with African prints I get from the Indiana Black Expo. You will have people from Ghana who will bring their clothing or people from Nigeria. I make sure that whenever I go there to buy clothing, I support the small businesses. And it's nice because it makes me feel like I'm connected with my ancestors. The shikis were also embraced. These garments grew in popularity in North America in the 1960s during the Black Power era. Black women activist leaders, such as Kathleen Cleaver, wore them frequently during that time. Black women continue to wear dashikis today to show pride in Black identity and align with Black resistance movements. Kara, pictured here, said, I feel like the dashiki is part of the Black Lives Matter or the African diaspora movement. I feel like it's the easiest go-to go thing to get. Fearless expression of Black, of Black creativity was evident with when Truth and Lucille described some of their everyday looks. When talking about her gray, red, and white flannel, Truth said, I love flannels, especially vintage ones. I feel like this outfit shows my style in more ways than one because it shows that I can be creative. And it can be a bold statement piece. Lucille negotiated the tensions about wearing her chiffon peasant top pictured on the right. She debated wearing it because she related that doing so might overstep boundaries of what she felt was acceptable as an African-American living in the United States, wearing African-inspired prints. She concluded that she does wear it, even if it does communicate notions of African-inspired designs. Vivica wore a cap with the continent of Africa embroidered on the front in the pan-African flag colors pictured in the middle here. She explained this accessory was overt and loud in expressing her blackness, but she had many individuals on campus not recognize the shape of the continent of Africa, which highlights some of the educational labor her and other women experience when overtly embracing their blackness. She said, that's a hat showing where I'm from. It's just a proud, say it loud, you know what I'm saying, type of hat. I wear the hat wherever, I would just throw it on. While wearing it on campus, a couple, a couple of people have asked me what the logo is. I was like, what do you think? You don't know? It's a continent. This is common knowledge. So for them to look me in my eyes and ask me, what is that on your hat? I don't really have anything to say to you. So yes, that is something that has stuck out a couple of times. Princess also wore waist beads as an expression of her black identity. She understood the original meaning and significance of this accessory and reimagined their meaning in a more contemporary context. She said, it is part of African culture. There are different representations of the waist beads throughout different African cultures. I feel like the newer generation loses more meaning of the waist beads because I don't wear waist beads for the original meaning. We just wear them now for the beauty of it. We usually start at a young age. Our mothers put them on us while when we are babies, basically, and you keep doing it. The original meaning for waist beads symbolizes that you are a virgin. And when you get married, your husband rips it off and then you are no longer a virgin. That's in some African countries, but now we just wear it for beauty standards. A number of the women were STEM majors and expressed that many of their classes are dominated by white males who are subtly and actively engaging in racist behaviors. They also described that as black women, when they are asked what they are studying in college, the common response is, are you sure you can do that? In Lucille's case, she explained she is often given the role of the secretary in group projects. She said, definitely being an engineer, I am in a bunch of classes with predominantly white males. So when we are doing certain projects, I end up being the secretary. I kind of end up taking on that role because everything else they feel like they've got this. She wore her raw bacon robotics t-shirt proudly to show her success as a black woman in STEM. Many of the women embodied messages of Black strength through t-shirts with graphics. For example, Vivica wore the shirt that reads Black Dollars Matter to support and uplift other Black people. She said, 
because I believe that if we keep our dollars generated within our businesses, then we have no choice but to keep growing. And then I think we'll be just fine. Her message here is about social change and Black entrepreneurial success. The women also frequently wore t-shirts with other powerful words related to Black empowerment. For example, the t-shirt pictured in the middle has a quote from Brian Stevenson, a lawyer and social justice activist who founded the Equal Justice Initiative in 1989 in Montgomery, Alabama. The organization is committed to ending mass incarceration and excessive punishment in the United States, challenging racial and economic injustice and protecting basic human rights for the most vulnerable people in American society. Just Mercy is Stevenson's best-selling book published in 2015, which outlines the story of the Equal Justice Initiative and its mission to challenge wrongful convictions and unfair sentences. Many of the women were advocates and supported a variety of social movements, including disability rights, Black Lives Matter, prison reform, LGBTQ rights, mental health, the Flint water crisis, and, and sustainability. In the shirt on the right, Marie expresses her solidarity with women's rights by wearing the Mount Nasty t-shirt. The shirt was designed and released in response to the instance during the third presidential debate in 2016, when Donald Trump called Hillary Clinton a quote, nasty woman, as she was discussing taxes, evidence of his continued misogyny and repulsive behavior toward women. The Black women college student uh, experience at predominantly white institutions, specifically during the Black Lives Matter era is unique and undoubtedly important. Black Lives Matter has significantly affected the Black community and has encouraged Black students, in this case, Black women students, to become more knowledgeable and vocal in activism, often through their everyday dress. These modern <clears throat> Black women college students continue the rich history of Black women utilize, utilizing dress to overtly express Black and activist identity through various everyday styling practices. The recognition of these styling practices allows a space for society to acknowledge that Black women continue to resist racism, discrimination, and oppression while empowering themselves through these everyday processes of fashioning the body. The Soul Sister became a role model for many teenagers who, who aspired to attend college in the mid 20th century. In the 1970s, college was more accessible for Black people, became a space for Black liberation, and a space for soul sister fashions and styles to thrive. The Black women college students featured in our exhibition are arguably the 21st century representations of the soul sister. It is important to note that all of the garments in the exhibit had to be loaned by uh, women. We had to do this because our collection had little to no representation of the Black uh, woman experience. It's also important to note that the dress forms you uh, sometimes saw with an image of this presentation were all made of white fabric. But in the final exhibition uh, seen here, the mannequins were different shades of darker skin tones. Because of systematic racism within museum culture, we took on additional labor to undress all of the forms, cover them with fabric that is representative of Black women's skin tones, and then redress them all. And if you'd like to learn more about that process, you can watch our presentation at the QR code on the slide. Uh, you can see more about the exhibition uh, in the digital catalog. Uh, so the QR code will um, bring you to the website where you can view all of the vignettes and the objects um, information um, for all of the different items featured in the exhibition. Lastly, <clears throat> we would like to have a moment of silence for our colleague Dana Gooden, who tragically um, passed away in uh, 2020. She was uh, instrumental in mounting this exhibition, particularly the covering of the mannequins to create Black skin tones. She is <clears throat> greatly missed. Uh, we are thankful for her passion for social justice and dedication to democratizing education through museum exhibitions. Thank you very much.